Hi, and welcome to the new Murder in Your Backyard podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Sean Tucker. Today we'll be talking about the Popeye's Chicken 1994 murders. There were four people involved. That included 17-year-old Bryant Archer, Nathaniel Baker, who was also 17, Daryl Collier, the 21-year-old store manager, and Tamika Collins, the 18-year-old assistant manager. So this was a prom night. It was heavily downpouring outside. The 17-year-olds wanted to leave because the store kept flickering on and off power, so they couldn't even really make a lot of chicken. Uh, Everything just kind of kept going on and off, and they kept asking the store manager and the assistant manager if they could leave. They said there was probably maybe four or five customers all night. There wasn't many at all. There was a little bit of schedule changing. There's been a lot of back and forth, so I do want to clarify that as far as I know, the only person whose schedule was changed was Tamika Collins. Originally, she wasn't supposed to be there, but... Being that someone else had to go to prom that night, her schedule was changed beforehand. She was on the schedule the night that it happened, but originally she wasn't supposed to be there. As far as I know, everything else was orderly and supposed to be the same way that it was brought in. Daryl had just started. That wasn't his first day. That's another speculation. People in guests and still believe that he had just started that day. He, he did start that week, I believe, but it wasn't the day of the event. So we're just going to start with the remainder of of the story. I'll I'll kind of tell a little briefing on what happened. They went to take the garbage out as they closed the store. As they got to the end in the back door, Nathaniel Baker was taking out the trash. Daryl Collier had opened the back door, and as he opened the the back door, two assailants came in, one with a gun in hand. One of them's name was Tomoke Pareda, and the other one's name was Robert Bryant Melson. As they came in, they took the people into the office, stole $2,100 in cash, took them to the freezer, and the shooting began. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm going to let the people tell their story. So as they uh, shot the the people or the victims, they made their exit out the back door. And behind this introduction here, I will have statements from Bryant Archer, who was the only survivor, and also Dawn Ward, who was the store manager's sister. Statements from responding officer Lane Keener, and uh, we'll have statements and Q&A from Scott Hilton, who was the Eagle Rock Boys Ranch owner and founder, and he tried to take Parade in before the events happened, but stuff just didn't work out the way he wanted. It didn't come to be. Well, Joe, did the um, did the victims know the killers? Parade was actually a worker. He worked there, as far as my understanding is, he worked there about two weeks, cased the place out, got to know the ins and outs of the business, you know, as he closed he saw that the back door was being used as the place to, to make entry if he needed to come in. He also saw where the drops were going, the money drops, and how to gain access to the the money at night. So he took that to his advantage to uh, get in the store. All right. And I think I, if I remember reading the story correctly, the cops were able to was it identify the suspects with the... Uh, they had left uh, a shoe print. That's correct. Right beside the... At the time in 94, there was a Taco Bell right beside the Popeye's chicken. So in the middle of that, there's a water slough. And the assailants, as the water fell down, they were standing in that slough as they came in. They'd actually eaten at the Taco Bell beside it. So as they came in, there was a shoe print left inside of the water slough there. And they were actually able to pour a mold. That mold left a, a full-on print. So when they were apprehended later on, they took that print. And as they lifted it, they could tell that that was yeah. Rob Melson's shoe print. I'm a- I I hope and assume that they still would have caught them, but it probably would have been harder without that that shoe print. I think it would have been it would have been easy to identify Pareda because yeah. Pareda was the worker that had been there. Bryant Archer gave his account that Pareda was there that night, and just knowing that he had that identifying haircut through Bryant's testimony, he he was able to be apprehended, and they could tell that was him. But without that shoe print, I don't think they would have known right away that was Melson. Melson was in the vehicle. But he claimed that he wasn't there. And Parade also turned around and claimed that Melson was picked up later. He dropped off another black male and picked oh. up Melson. And then Melson just happened to be in the car later. Oh, okay, on. so that that shoe print got Melson. Got Melson, Okay. 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 Um, and then uh, how how were they apprehended? As they were leaving Parade's house, they pulled up and, and were able to get the suspects the reason they were able to get them so quickly, they picked them up later that night. I think it was in a, within an hour or two. Bryant's testimony, Bryant Archer's testimony, was that well, he gave them the answer straight up. As soon as they entered the Popeye's Chicken, he told them what the car making model was, which was a 1980s Monte Carlo. So they, they went pretty much right to his address in, okay. in Rainbow City, and Rainbow City police apprehended him rather than Gadsden. Gadsden did find out that it was a car. They had a 
bolo out for that, that vehicle. Okay, and then you said, you said shots were fired, so they, like, what I'm trying to get here, the, the way it's been presented to me and described, it looked like it was a robbery. Why go back in and kill these people, murder these people? It's senseless. Like, I don't, I don't think Paredes. I couldn't say that Pareto wanted to kill him. He could have, but I would, I would think that Pareto was in it for the robbery itself. I don't know if he even knew that Melson was going to kill him. He knew Melson had a gun. I believe the the gun belonged to Pareto, as far as I know from reading it. But I also think that Pareto, being a 17 year old male, I don't know if he was quite there where he wanted to come in and and just kill these people in cold blood. He may have just wanted to take the money and, and get out. But unfortunately, as the door closed and reopened, shots began coming through and unfortunately killed these three people and hurt Brian Archer. And did they, did, did the victims know these people outside of uh, Popeyes or was it just working with them? Tamika Collins, she was a Gaston State Community College student. So she, as far as my understanding, she may have known Brian Melson because I have heard from someone else who knew both of them that you know he he kind of flirted with her and he knew Bryant also but as far as Bryant Melson and Tamika I'm not totally sure but it's possible that they knew each other couldn't tell you for sure okay um and were there any statements from the police about about the the murder we'll be hearing from uh, officer Lane Keener also in this podcast and he goes on to, to tell about some distinctive memories he had as he entered the building and some of the stuff he got to see and and do and what what went on throughout the night as the events unfolded. I did speak with Officer Randy Phillips also, but I didn't get any kind of audio or video. He told me more of more of his statements would more so do damage or hurt the family more than what they needed to hear. So we just cut everything off, and he gave me a briefing on everything that went on that night. With that being said, is I, I assume that, that they closed this business. Is this Popeyes still there? The Popeyes is still there. The Popeyes has been rearranged. Uh, they took the freezer out. It's been remodeled heavily, but the inside of the building is pretty much the same as it was back in 94. I actually ate there for the first time after I interviewed Brian Archer. He told me that just because something happened and just because tragic events unfolded the way they did, it wasn't Popeyes' fault that this was done. It was the fault of these two individuals that, that yeah. made this not happen. But he has no hurt against Popeyes, I guess you would say. He, he said no. it's still a great place to eat. So as soon as I got done, I jumped in the truck and I went straight to Popeyes. Uh, it was a great place to eat, but I, I did want to kind of see the insides and outsides of the buildings and, and see kind of what, what might have taken place. Since you knew, you know this incident and you know the uh, what, what had happened and all that, was there a bit of eeriness or anything when you went in there because you know like if it's me and i don't know anything right and i go into this popeyes and i get some food i don't know you know you know i don't know anything but since you knew the history was there a little bit of like eeriness for you well i saw on television i was maybe nine or ten years old at this time 94 i it kind of freaked me out seeing two assailants you know had yeah. been on the run and that's all i knew you know and looking back it, it just kind of it's just kind of terrifying at that time. Uh, as I've gotten older and meeting Archer and, and making my way into Popeyes, I wouldn't say uh, there was eeriness, but just the seeing what could have happened, you know, while I was yeah. there, your your mind shifts to what happened in '94, and you, you see it through different eyes, especially after talking to these people about it. Kind of, yeah. really, you know, not really really living it, but just. And I did ask questions to people that were working there, but. It was just kind of shunned off or thrown off, yeah. and they couldn't tell me much about it. And uh, I'm, I don't know if, you know, 94 was what, um, 20 years ago now? 30. 30? 30 years 30 ago? 30 years ago. Yeah, so it was we just We actually just met the anniversary of the 30th uh, last month. Oh, wow. So this is the 30th, 30th anniversary of the Popeye Okay, so, yeah, so I would assume the franchisee, franchisee owner... Um, is he still around? Is it the original owner of that Popeyes? In one of my statements from Bryant, I believe that the owner has passed away. I'm not sure if that was in one of the interviews that I did with him. He has since passed, and I don't yeah. think he lived much longer than the original shooting. And I believe you were also telling me um, that Bryant 
it was very tough on him after, right? That, like, you know, he was in the hospital and he was, like, had a long road to recovery, right? That's and right. And that it was... It was... Not everything, like, his medical expenses were not... He only got a little bit of money. Yeah, he didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't get much of anything. He's uh, still had a lot of issues from that. And, and it's just a horrible... Horrible, senseless chain of events, not only for him, but also these other families that, yeah. that uh, they've had to endure, and, you know, throughout the years, try to reach out to some of these people, like Tamika Collins' family. I hadn't heard back, but I do know that since Nelson has been executed in prison, they, I think they, that was a closure for them, I believe, yeah. you know, and, and I read that in the papers at one time, so... Seeing that closure for them, I, it's not really a continuation or, or open trying to open scars with this story. It's more of a way. I know Archer still wants to get this out there, and every once in a while, the guests and Tom's will post something every ten to fifteen years. You yeah. know, what kind of memory is that for, for you know, for those people? I mean, yeah, it's it's not scars. It's yeah. you know, memories. And uh, speaking of you know, remembering, um, you know, like the the blockbuster murder in in Aniston. And of course they they closed that blockbuster down, but they they had a memorial there to the victims. Is there a memorial to the victims at this Popeyes? No, there isn't. I know back at 94 directly after it happened there was a sign out there and it, you know, it said specifically, you know, sorry to the loss of these families or something yeah. of that nature and there's nothing now. I mean, you can't you can just pass it day to day and you would never even know anything happened there. So Yeah. Um it's this far beyond tragedy you know it's, it's hurt yeah. several people uh, do you think it's just because i well i i don't know i guess that the i guess the the owner didn't you know think because i guess whoever owns the building would be the one putting the memorial there so i guess maybe he didn't want to i couldn't speak on his behalf yeah. so I'd, I'd like to be able to say or even contact him but so, i couldn't speak on behalf yeah. of so someone from there it. it'd just be us uh assuming and theorizing right Correct. so um the other thing i wanted to get back to was wasn't there some uh and i guess when you're in prison and you're on death row you're gonna kind of change your story maybe a little bit or and all that wasn't there a little bit different you know w between the two uh um uh suspects like like th going back and saying oh it wasn't me it was actually him who, who well, shot Pareto. Pareda never said he did or didn't. Pareda himself wasn't the shooter. Uh, but Pareda did turn around and say that Melson wasn't the guy he picked up that night. He, okay. As his first two statements were, yes, I picked him up. Yes, he was the shooter. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, he turned around and changed his statement, I guess, to try to relieve him and get him at least back to maybe where he can get a conviction of life in prison rather than a death sentence. Death sentence, but they had his shoe print, so he was obviously. Yeah, he was. I mean, he was there. There was. Uh, you can't. You can't deny those statements. Yeah, so Even though his, you know, his statements and his claims were, yeah, all the same. And his attorneys were firing back that the cops had done this, and maybe they framed his shoe prints. You know, yeah. and, uh, but also the victim was who survived was like, no, yeah, they were both there, right? He 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 couldn't fully say at the time. Yeah. Because he had, they had masks over the face. He didn't know Pareto had the shaved, and he could tell. But I think, as far as I know, it was he's just it was like a black guy. But the the shoe print doesn't lie. You know that's yeah. uh, set in stone. So one in a one in a million. You know you, yeah. you don't hardly ever see that in the case. Okay. So and then I think also the a part of the the whole story that that I had read too was. Um, uh, Trying to remember, forgive me, I forget the name. There's Pareda, and who's the other guy? Brian Melson. 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 Um, he's the one who would harass, right? Years later, would call up and harass the family. No, that's, that was a uh, Pareda. Pareda uh, would do that. So okay. Brian Melson's already been executed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pareda at, was 17 years old at the time this happened, also. So he was at the same age as Nathaniel Baker and Brian Archer. Oh, to, sorry to interrupt you there, but that also cuts into. They were the first ones, right, to be tried. There was Correct. the new Alabama law, yes. right? So him being 17, that week they had just passed a law that teenagers could be tried as adults. That set him in motion to 
be tried as an adult, which landed him in prison for this crime and gave him the sentence of life in prison, which he got life in prison because, for one, he wasn't the shooter and he was 17, so I guess they had convicted him on, on that yeah. sentence. But that's that's where it stood. So Pareto got life. Bryant Melson, the shooter, got the death penalty. Dang. And then he would bother the Pareto would call and bother Pareto. Yeah, harass. Pareto would harass some of the victims' families and and kind of reach out and, and do stuff. I want to let Archer tell his story more about that and leave okay. it that because some of these guys I don't I don't want to take any anything from them because uh, this is their life and I just kind of want to tell tidbits and kind of get the ball rolling on the story. I want I want Scott to be able to tell more about Pareto and Lane Keener to be able to tell about coming to the scene of the crime and what he saw and experienced throughout. And also, uh, Bryant, you know, just um, keep him, you know, keep him in your prayers and be able to uh, hopefully write a book one day. That's what he would like to do, have none on his end. And then, especially since we don't, well, even if we did have a memorial, just, you know, keep the, the victims, you know, memories alive and in your thoughts. And also that this murder doesn't define their lives. There's more to them than just Correct. this event, like... They were humans That's, with hopes, dreams, and emotions and all that and deserve to be remembered for correct. for who they were. And with the murder in your backyard, I want to keep this flowing because there's several people, not only that have been massacred or murdered, stabbed or shot, there's also people missing. And there's several of them, not only throughout the nations, but here in Alabama and right here in Cahoon and Etowah County. So I'm hoping through this we can also maybe find some of those people or right now this this main interest, I want to stay with Popeyes and Bryant Archer and his story and hopefully get this to anyone who will listen. Yeah, hopefully so. So thank you so much for the first podcast of Murder in Your Backyard. I'm Joseph Kramer. I'm Sean Tucker. You guys have a good night.